Hello, and welcome to the Cancer Interviews podcast. I'm your host, Jim Foster, and we are sharing the cancer journey together. If you find the information in today's episode helpful, then we invite you to please subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel by clicking on the links below and clicking on the bell to be notified when we post a new episode. Please note that we do not provide medical advice on this podcast, and we recommend that you consult with a licensed medical doctor regarding your medical situation. On today's program, we have an amazing guest with us whose story will hopefully provide a great deal of information and inspiration. She is a colon cancer survivor and is joining us today from her farm outside of Frankfort, Kentucky. She has enjoyed a long career in public service and has served under seven different governors in the great Commonwealth of Kentucky and ultimately served as the 56th Lieutenant Governor of Kentucky. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Governor Crit Llewellyn to the show. Crit, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Thank you, Jim. It's great to join you this morning. Well, we're very glad to have you, and thank you so much for being here and taking time out of your busy day to share your story with our audience. And if you're ready, let's get right to it. Sound good? Sounds great. Okay. So, Crip, before we get into talking about your cancer journey, why don't you take a few moments to tell us about yourself, like where you're from, what your life was like growing up, what your interests were, and what your work was prior to your cancer experience. Well, thank you, Jim. And again, I appreciate so much your efforts to put together the series of interviews with cancer survivors. I think we are the ones who can understand best perhaps how to give hope to those who are going through the cancer experience. Uh, when I was growing up, I lived right here on this farm where I live today. Uh, my family has very deep roots in central Kentucky, and I live in the old farmhouse where I was born and raised outside of Frankfurt, our capital city. And I had five older brothers, um, which I think helped me when I got into the political arena later because it never occurred to me there wasn't anything that I couldn't do that those boys could do. So uh, <laughs> that, that uh, gave me perhaps some training uh, as I entered politics. Um, I went to Center College, which is a small liberal arts school here in Kentucky, and then I began working in political campaigns initially and ultimately evolved into public policy positions. Uh, I served with seven Kentucky governors throughout my career. Uh, right before my cancer diagnosis, I was serving as Kentucky State Auditor. That is an elected position. I had run statewide and been elected the prior year to that four-year term when I received my cancer diagnosis. But after um, I was treated successfully, I was able to return to my career. I never stepped down from my job. I kept working and later um, served as Lieutenant Governor of Kentucky. And now I am retired and serving very actively on a number of boards and also involved in a lot of political campaign work on behalf of candidates. Wow, well that's, a, that's quite a resume and quite a passion you have uh, to serve the public and uh, that's very admirable. What uh, what was your most fulfilling role uh, in your in your work over the years? Ah, uh, well, when I served as lieutenant governor, <clears throat> Kentucky um, had embraced enthusiastically the passage of the Affordable Care Act under President Barack Obama, and our governor at the time, Steve Bashir. Uh, saw it as a great opportunity for Kentucky to try to address some of our systemic challenges in the health of our people. We have some of the worst statistics for health in Kentucky. Uh, we're, we have the highest mortality rate for cancer in America here in Kentucky. Uh, we have some of the worst statistics for heart disease, lung disease, obesity. Uh, we have a very high rate of smoking um, that has, of course, been a factor in all of that. So, as Lieutenant Governor, I chaired an initiative called Kentucky Health Now, and it was our job to uh, track the progress that was made when we began to expand health care uh, to many more Kentuckians. Over 400,000 Kentuckians were reached uh, initially through that effort. And we were really pushing um, the idea of more prevention, more screening, um, having people who had never had a doctor before, having a medical home where they could get the appropriate checkups and preventive care. 
And we saw that and still see that as the real key to turning around Kentucky's traditional uh, health challenges for our people. So that, um, that role that I played as Lieutenant Governor was very rewarding and I think uh, we were making a big difference. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, congratulations on your, on your efforts there. What was your overall health uh, like um, over your life uh, prior to uh, your cancer experience? You know, I was in good health. Um, I was in my early 50s when this happened. I, um, as I look back on it, I was not paying enough attention to diet and exercise, um, all of the things that I know much more about now. Um, I think we all, when we are younger, tend to think that these, these issues won't impact us. Um, so after my cancer, I became much more focused on um, and, in, and intentional about uh, my diet, um, exercise, taking care of myself, making sure that I'm doing every single preventive test that's possible in every screen, and, and just having much more awareness. But I was, in, I was in good health before this happened. Was there a history of cancer in your family, and what can you tell us about that? Yes. In fact, my mother had died of colon cancer, and that really was the trigger for me to get my first checkup. I, when I turned 50, my, it was actually my gynecologist when I went in for just an annual routine checkup who said you should get a colonoscopy at 50 because your mother uh, had colon cancer. And I put it off for a year because I had no symptoms. I felt fine. I didn't see any reason to rush and do it. And when I went back the next year for another checkup, she said, you have to get a colonoscopy. You're very high risk because of your mother's um, having the disease. So I did that. I went in for a colonoscopy. I had no symptoms. Uh, it was a routine screening, and they immediately found the cancer. So if it hadn't been for that doctor really pushing me uh, to go ahead and get that colonoscopy, uh, you know, who knows what the outcome might have been. As it was, it was early stage and treatable. So um, taking those tests and advice of the doctor and the led to early detection, which might have otherwise not been detected for some time after that. So that's very important. And uh, I know a lot of us uh, tend to put those tests off and, and so forth. Um, so you didn't have any symptoms. Uh, the test came back with some results that led to, what was the next sequence of events that led to, uh, to your actual diagnosis? Well, I was absolutely shocked. Um, my husband and I both were reeling from the news that I had cancer because we had no warning and no symptoms. And I considered myself very healthy. Um, we were immediately referred to the Markey Cancer Center at the University of Kentucky, which is a nationally accredited cancer center here. And thankfully, I was able to uh, have a team of doctors at the Markey Cancer Center uh, who then um, worked with us on a schedule of treatment. And um, it was very um, helpful to be close to home. When, when my mother had colon cancer, she died in 1986. And at that point in Kentucky, everyone said, you have to leave the state for treatment. We don't have the skills here to treat you successfully. So in my mother's case, we were back and forth to the MD Anderson Cancer Clinic in Texas uh, for over three years prior to her oh. passing away. Um, now in Kentucky, we have an outstanding cancer facility at the University of Kentucky. We have another one, the Brown Cancer Center at the University of Louisville. And that's a real positive development for the people of Kentucky because we can receive top-notch care here locally. Um, so I, I went, I had surgery um, and had a colon resection uh, that was um, successful in removing the tumor. Okay. So when you found out your husband was with you and you felt confident in your doctor uh, and the diagnosis and the, the proposed treatment, did you pursue any additional opinions or did you feel 
hundred percent confident with your medical team that you had in place initially? Well, I had a, a close friend who I went to high school, grew up with, went to grade school and high school with from here in Frankfort, Kentucky, who was a surgeon in Lexington. <clears throat> and he provided me a good um, overview of what my options were. And he um, did some research on where the best skills and abilities were to deal with my particular situation. And I had great faith in him. And in the end, he told me he thought that I, I could find everything I needed in terms of expertise here in Kentucky at the University of Kentucky. So um, I was fortunate because I had someone who did some of that groundwork for me. Um, if I had not had confidence in him, we certainly would have looked around on our own and gotten some second opinions perhaps. But in that case, I had a very good trusted friend and doctor who who helped me make the final decision to pursue my treatment here at the Markey Cancer Center. Well, that's great. It's uh, one of the most important things, in my opinion, is to have confidence in your doctor and your medical team. And you were very fortunate to have that uh, long, long-time friend uh, and colleague to, uh, to guide you through that. Um, so the, uh, so you, were, you were with your husband when you found out. Did you tell your friends and family right away, or what was that process like? Well, that was an interesting process because at the time I was serving as state auditor, which is an, uh, an elected position, statewide constitutional office. I had just run a statewide campaign the year before. I'd had television advertising and traveled all over the state and spent a year running for office. So I was highly visible. And I was serving in a position of trust um, on behalf of the voters of Kentucky. And we decided that we had to make my medical diagnosis very public because we didn't want it to look as if we were hiding the information from the public or we didn't want rumors uh, started that were not accurate about what my uh, prognosis might be. Um, so, you know, in politics, I've, I've learned over time, it's best to be as transparent as possible. So we actually did a press release that laid out the details of exactly what my diagnosis was, what my prognosis was. We had a quote from my doctor in it explaining um, our path forward. And uh, that, was, um, that was difficult, I think, for my family, my extended family. My husband and I, before the press release went out, my husband and I had to divide up a long list of of relatives and call everyone and explain it personally before they saw it in the newspaper. And um, that was difficult. Um, you know, one thing I've learned over time is we still have a stigma involving cancer that I think we all have to work to overcome. Um, in, in my mother's generation, she didn't get the proper checkups and, and have the proper preventive care because she was afraid to know if she had cancer because to her, to her generation, it was considered a death sentence. And now we know so much more about it. Um, and, th and that's why I think we all need to be transparent about our, our situations and talk to people openly about it. I remember one relative when we made all the phone calls telling them uh, that this had happened, this diagnosis had been made and we were about to release it to the press. One relative said to me, oh, do you have to tell people? And I said, yes, we have to tell people. And she said, well, they'll all think differently of you now. Hmm. <laughs> and I think that speaks to the stigma that surrounds cancer. And I think we all feel that when we get this diagnosis, that people feel great sorrow and pity for us, but they don't know exactly how to talk to us. They don't know what to say. They don't know what the right thing is to do to help us. Um, and I think the more we talk about it, the more open we are about it, um, the more that helps to dispel that stigma and, and let people know that um, this is something that happens in everyone's life. I always have said, I've done a lot of speaking about cancer in my experiences and encouraging um, preventive care. And I, one of the things I've said is, if, if cancer hasn't touched you or your family, it just hasn't happened yet because it is prevalent everywhere. And we know so much more now about how to prevent it and treat it 
that we need to be very open about it and very um, transparent about all of it. So that's what we did in my case. And we were very um, upfront about everything along the way. And ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Crit Llewellyn, a former Lieutenant Governor of Kentucky and very fortunate colon cancer survivor. Crit, uh, can you give us a, without going into huge detail, can you give us a general overview of your cancer treatments? Did, was there surgery, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, or some combination of those? What can you tell us about that? Well, I had both surgery and chemo and radiation. And, you know, in my case, it was the um, side effects of the chemo and radiation, which were the most difficult aspect of my cancer. Um, I spent 15 days in the hospital dealing with side effects of the chemo and radiation. And there was a time during that period where I was very, very sick. Um, basically, the, the chemo and radiation had destroyed my digestive system, and I just couldn't um, function properly, and I was very ill. Um, there was a time there I, I wasn't sure I was coming home. And, you know, to go from having no symptoms and not knowing I had a problem to suddenly being that ill uh, was traumatic, and it was hard for my family. Um, it was a very difficult time. A um, couple of lessons learned in my case, I think. One is, if you are a cancer patient, if you have a diagnosis of cancer, spend a lot of energy in the very beginning, making sure you have the team you trust. Um, and then once you have that team together and you've analyzed all your options about who's gonna treat you and where you're gonna receive treatment and how it's gonna be done, then put your faith in that team. Um, I know in my case, I'm, I'm sort of a take charge, wanna boss people around type personality. <laughs> And I had to put that aside and put myself in the hands of my medical team and just focus myself on staying positive and hopeful. And that's my other significant piece of advice is don't ever think that there's not a direct connection between your mental health and your physical health. If, if you are positive and hopeful and focused on the future, it really does help you fight this. And uh, the, the more you can keep your thoughts focused on the potential um, beyond the disease to, to envision the things you'll do and the places you'll go and the, the children and grandchildren you'll spend time with when this is over and not fixating on the terrible anxieties and fears that are so difficult to, to battle every day, it really does help you get through it. And it helps your family get through it if you can stay as positive as possible. Sometimes I think these cancer cases are harder on the caregivers than they are the patient. We know how we're feeling and what we're going through, but our spouses and partners and immediate family all are terrified for us and don't know what to do to help. And anything we can do as patients, I think, to stay as positive as possible, it really helps the whole situation. So true, uh, so true. Now, uh, you mentioned caregivers. Uh, was uh, was your husband one of your caregivers, or what? Can you tell us primary, briefly about that? He, he was my primary caregiver. He took great care of me, um, and uh, we have grown children. Um, everyone was very helpful, but uh, my husband was right there beside me, and I think that is a key to um, to recovery. Is is being sure that your spouse is. In, involved and engaged in every discussion with the medical team so that they understand and know what, what's going on and why and uh, can be as supportive as possible. Um, because that, uh, you know, I have friends who don't have immediate family who've, who've gone through cancer and it's so much more difficult when you don't have not just the, the physical support and the care, but the emotional support of having someone you can share it with and someone you can talk to about it and, and share your deepest fears and concerns. So uh, I think every cancer patient needs to identify who are those people who are closest to you, who are emotionally connected to you in ways where they can share this with you and you're not alone. I totally agree, that's, that's very important. Now, uh, did you undergo your treatments in or near the town that you lived in, or did you have to travel, and what was that like? 
Well, I, I live about 30 minutes from the University of Kentucky Market Cancer Center. So I was very fortunate in that regard. I was able to go in, um, drive over easily for my treatments. Um, so when I would have chemo, we would drive in and spend the day there uh, having infusions. Um, when I was doing radiation, I would drive in for treatment. Different friends and family took turns taking me. Uh, because I wasn't feeling well once it started. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I spent 15 days as an inpatient um, inpatient uh, room at the hospital because I had such severe side effects. So we were fortunate that it was close uh, because, as I've mentioned, when my mother was um, diagnosed with colon cancer, we were traveling back and forth to Texas from Kentucky, which is not a simple task. We have to go through Atlanta by plane and lots of trips back and forth. Um, so... I think that that is one of the biggest challenges. If you can get your treatment close to home, it ensures that you not only don't have the hassle and the challenge of travel, but you also are surrounded by your network of family and friends who can provide support and encouragement. And uh, in my case, that was extremely helpful. In my mother's case, when, when I took her to Texas, the last time we were down there, we spent three months uh, dealing with her chemo treatments and her side effects of that. And we were totally isolated from her network of family and friends. And she was um, 72 years old and had a lot of wonderful extended family here in Kentucky. So in the end, we brought her back home on an ambulance plane because she didn't want to die there away from all of her people who cared about her. I certainly understand, and, and some of the small things you can be thankful for that, that you were able to undergo your treatments nearby, so um, some of the, the silver linings, I guess. Um, the, I know when I was first diagnosed with cancer the first time, um, not only did I feel all alone, even though my parents were there and so forth, but one of the big fears, other than hearing the you know, the diagnosis was, am I going to lose my hair? And uh, I did <laughs> both times, even the second time around uh, due to the chemotherapy. It grew back. And, uh, but our audience often wonders, uh, I know that's a big anxiety for a lot of people. And do you mind if I ask if, if your hair was affected by your treatments? Well, I lost a lot of my hair, but not all of it. I got very skinny hair. <laughs> it became very thin and scraggly. Um, and then I wore my hair longer. I think women in particular have a lot of identity with their hair. Um, sure. So I was not as affected as some people are. Um, my mother lost all of her hair and, and took great pride in the array of wigs that she, uh, that she acquired. Um, in my case, I was fortunate I didn't lose it all. But it is, it is a source of anxiety for us all, I think, as cancer patients, because our hair is part of our identity. And it's, it's one of those pieces of cancer that there are so many parts of it that make you feel like you're no longer in control of your life. And that is one piece of it that is such a highly visible aspect that I think is really troubling to people. And um, I, I think you, you add that to the list of things you have hope about. Um, some people's hair grows back better it comes back curlier or it comes back thicker or you don't know what the future might hold but i tried to stay as positive about that as i could even while it was falling out in my hands as i took a shower sure sure uh what what was the lowest point uh you experienced during your cancer uh journey well, I think it's when I was in the hospital dealing with the side effects of the chemo because they were having a very hard time getting those reversed. And I, I began to feel my health was deteriorating in a way that I might not be able to recover. And as I mentioned, that seemed so shocking when I had not been sick or had any symptoms before all this started. Um, but my husband stayed very close to me through all of that. He, had, in fact, we, we were planning a, a trip to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary when all this happened. So he would sit beside my hospital bed with a travel guide 
and, and say, well, here's where we would have been today. And he would read me the description. And here's a restaurant we probably would have had dinner in and this travel guide. And he'd read me about that, you know, just trying to encourage me to think about life outside of that hospital room. Um, and he really helped me get through it. Um, so as an anniversary gift, he, he bought two trees and had them planted in our yard. Oh, wow. And they were very small trees. And he said, these, you're going to be home to watch these trees grow into full adult size trees. That will happen. Oh, you that's know, amazing. Little things like that to keep you focused on the future. Sure. Now, ultimately, did you get to take a nice trip with your husband after uh, it was all over? I did. It is very important to have something to look forward to and, and to set a goal. I um, can totally vouch for that. Um, I had a physical therapist that would uh, come in uh, quite frequently, and he became a, a good friend. And, and later, he passed away from cancer himself, which was unfortunate. But uh, he came in and told me that uh, we were going to play golf together someday. and. Uh, he he would say that every time he saw me, and and we did eventually. So it was it was a real nice treat to have something to look forward to and um, and set a, and set a goal like that um, for yourself. Um, how long did your treatments last? It was are we talking a few months, a year, or years? About, what? about three and a half months. Okay. And you were able to continue working as the state auditor at that time? Well, I had to take a leave for about the last two months of that as I began to have more serious side effects. Sure, I could imagine that'd be difficult to work at all through, through that. Um, but then I was able to return to work. Um, once, the, once the treatment stopped and I was able to get uh, things back in balance uh, with my digestive tract and so forth, I was, um, I recovered pretty quickly because it was not advanced cancer that was causing me to be so sick. It was the side effects of the, of the treatment. So I was able to return to work and, uh, you know, ever since then I've been diligent about checkups. I see, I still see a doctor, a gastroenterologist at the Market Cancer Center once a year. Um, I do a colonoscopy now every two years. I'm due for one right now in the next few weeks. I have one. Um, and I do every other screening I can get. I do a mammogram. I do bone, bone density tests. I, I do uh, pap smears. I do everything that my doctor recommends because I, I'm a walking, living example of the value of early screening, especially for colon cancer. Colon cancer is the one cancer that we can actually prevent through proper screening. If, if a colonoscopy finds polyps in an early stage, they can remove those before they become cancerous. And if we can just encourage more people to see that, the value of that colonoscopy, even though it's, it's distasteful and it's embarrassing to talk about and people don't like to think about it and all of those things, just do it. You know, it's so important. Well, you're, I'm 53, and uh, my doctor's been bugging me the last uh, three years about that. And Damn, you've got to go do that. I'm going to, and I, um, I know even I'm probably more um, uh, at risk than other people having, having had Hodgkin lymphoma uh, twice. And um, so you're, you're going to put me over the edge here, Craig. I'm, I'm going Good. in. <laughs> Good. So thank you for that encouragement. The uh, one last thing on your on your uh, cancer part before we talk about what you're doing today. Uh, what was it like the moment that you learned that your cancer was in remission? What was that like? It was an incredible relief. But I think every cancer patient also knows that you live for a long time afterward with a fear in the back of your mind that it's still there or that it might come back tomorrow. Um, it was a long time before I stopped thinking about it every day. 
um, before I, it, you know, it, it consumes you when you're dealing with it. And I think it takes a long time for our mind to adjust to the fact that you're really okay. And you're vigilant about every little tweak that you feel that's abnormal in your body and how your uh, any symptoms that you think might be um, concerning. Uh, it took me a long time before I stopped thinking about it every day. Sure. How long did it take uh, before you felt like your life was back to normal? Oh, you know, I was physically going about my business within a few months, but I think mentally you are still challenged with this um, consuming anxiety and fear that life might get off track again very quickly if this comes back. Um, so I'm going to say it was a couple of years before I really got to the point where I felt, um, okay, I'm all right now. Uh, I can I can focus on my future and not worry about this um, because it is such an all-consuming anxiety that we go through as cancer patients, um, and it takes a while for us to to get our bearings back. Sure. Well. Uh, you mentioned a little bit of what, what you've been doing after that, but uh, what are, uh, are there current organizations that you're involved with either professionally or as volunteer since you've been in remission? And, and what can you tell us about that work? Well, the one effort I've been involved in that's directly related to this is the Colon Cancer Prevention Project here in Kentucky. Um, Dr. Whitney Jones from Louisville uh, founded and initiated that effort, um, and I joined with him and served on the board starting, oh, maybe three or four years after my cancer. Um, so that's been 12 or so years ago. Um, and that effort has been very successful at trying to expand um, colon cancer screening to those who are uninsured and to spread the word about the value and importance of colon cancer screening. And in Kentucky, we took a major leap forward when we expanded health care here through the Affordable Care Act, as I mentioned earlier, because that extended insurance to another 400,000 Kentuckians. Uh, we still have a gap in Kentuckians who don't um, either don't have insurance at all or don't have coverage for colonoscopies. So uh, we've worked in recent years to get the state state government to fund um, a, a pool of money that is available for local health departments to help close that gap for people who need colon screening but are not covered. Um, so I've been very active in that and just... Um, anytime I can, getting involved in public service discussions or interviews like this one to just help raise awareness about the value of screening and also to share from a survivor's perspective um, some advice to those who are currently dealing with cancer. I'm also involved on several other boards. I'm on a, uh, my college, Center College Board of Trustees, um, on the board of the state's largest philanthropic foundation, the James Graham Brown Foundation. I'm on the bank board, I'm on the board of our uh, State Historical Society Foundation. I'm on about five, six boards and also helping a number of um, candidates for public office, including in Kentucky right now, U.S. Senate candidate and a congressional candidate here in our congressional district. So I stay busy. Wow. <laughs> that sounds like you're busier than before in many ways. So uh, I think that's true. <laughs> I know people can learn more about you from your Wikipedia page, which is uh, very impressive, by the way. And uh, is that the best place for people to learn more about you and the work you're doing? Or is there somewhere else you'd like to mention? That's probably the best. Um, Wikipedia is sometimes... Um, not entirely accurate because different people can make changes to it, but I think right now it's got a pretty good summary of my professional career. Wonderful, wonderful. And we'll have links uh, to those resources below in uh, the description and the show notes and a link to the uh, colon cancer uh, prevention project that you mentioned as well. So um, 
before we wrap up here, Crit, uh, I have one final question for you. Imagine that you're speaking directly to someone that has just learned uh, that they have cancer. What would you like to say to them? I would say to focus all of your energy into having hope and being as positive as you can possibly be. First, being sure that you have the right medical team that you can put your trust in and then have hope and faith that you will get through this and put yourself in the hands of that team and trust their advice and then surround yourself with the people you love and care about and share everything you can with them so that they're part of your journey and really um, be sure that that circle of, of friends and family who are close to you are part of your journey so that they can help you through it. Uh, you'll be amazed at the incredible warmth and love that come to you once people know and understand what you're going through. And um, look to the future with great hope and promise. Well, Crit, those are certainly words of wisdom. And it's been a real honor to have you on the show today. And I'm sure our listeners have, have learned a lot from you uh, by sharing your journey with us. I know I have. And thank you very much for coming on the Cancer Interviews podcast. Thank you, Jim. It's been an honor to be with you. You're welcome. And please take a moment and leave your comments below and take a look at the description and show notes below with links to all of the valuable information that Crit has shared with us today. And remember, you're not alone. We're all in this together, and we wish you the absolute best possible outcome with your cancer journey. So until next time, please take care, and we'll see you on down the road. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.